Let me ask you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, if you have them. Stuart Briscoe was uh, one of my favorite Bible teachers as a brand new Christian. And uh, he still is, he's with the Lord now, but uh, he pastored Elmbrook Church in Wisconsin for 30 years, and then in the year 2000, he retired, and then along with his wife Jill and his son Pete, they started a ministry called Telling the Truth. And I would heartily recommend that ministry, it's online, and uh, it's on some radio stations, but I don't know that it's on any here locally. Um, but in any case, um, just recently, at the age of 91, he went home to be with the Lord. And I remember him telling the story one time when he first went to Elmbrook. In fact, it was the very first Sunday that he was there. And uh, there was a woman that came to him after the service, and she asked if he would find the answer to a technical question that she had about a particular Bible passage. To which uh, Dr. Briscoe replied, no ma'am, I won't. The woman had a shocked look on her face as if she didn't hear correctly. And she says, what? And Briscoe repeated, no ma'am, I will not find the answer to your question. And she looked at him as if to ask, well, what are we paying you for? And, uh, and so he said, here's what I will do. I'll show you how to find the answer yourself. And then he proceeded to show her how to investigate and look in the scriptures. The reason Pastor Briscoe did that was to illustrate, the, to illustrate the biblical philosophy of ministry that we've been talking about that we actually began last week in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, actually 1 through 16, but last week we covered verses 7 through 11. This morning we want to cover verses 11 and 12, so if you have your Bibles or you can look at it behind me. But Paul says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And what Briscoe did was essentially exercise his role as a pastor in seeking to equip this lady with what she needed to find out the truth herself. And as she learned how to do that, she would grow spiritually and then God could use her for the work of ministry as she matured in the faith. Remember we have been talking about spiritual gifts and to each and every believer, if you're born again, if the Spirit of God dwells within you, every one of us has a spiritual gift probably more than one, but one may be just prominent. But spiritual gifts were given to each follower of Christ, each believer. They are divine enablements. But then we looked at verse 11 where we saw that he gave specially gifted individuals, servants of the Lord, as gifts to the church. And there's a specific reason. Christ gives gifted servants to his church he gave some to, the, to be apostles and prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And these were servant leaders in the church that they had all the spiritual gifts that they needed to minister to the church, to serve the church. But it says he himself gave as if to say that, that he personally, sovereignly chose those whom he would raise up to serve in that capacity whether it be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And he chose them to fulfill their roles and their responsibilities to the church. And so I just want to do a quick review of what we learned last week where he talked about the apostles, apostles and prophets. We'll put them together this morning. But they, were, they had basically the same responsibilities. However, the prophets were subservient to the apostles. They had the authority in the early church. They taught God's revelation to the whole church. 
The prophets were usually part of a local church. The apostles also taught doctrine to the church, whereas the prophets generally gave specific revelation and sometimes more personal revelation. You remember when we were going through Acts that the, a prophet gave a personal prophecy to the apostle Paul about going to Jerusalem. But they had three basic functions. They were, number one, to lay the foundation of the church. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 says that having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Secondly, they received special revelation, divine revelation of God's word. God gave them this special revelation so that they could preach and teach and also write. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it was primarily the apostles that wrote our New Testament, but they weren't all apostles. And then thirdly, they were empowered to confirm the message that they preached by the working of signs and miracles and wonders. And so that was the three main things that they were responsible for. Now, when the New Testament was completed, the offices of apostles and prophets ceased. Be wary today of those who would call themselves apostles and prophets. You can find them all over on Christian television. But I think we all know the, uh, the character of some of these individuals, the false prophecies of some of these individuals, and, uh, and the love for money and recognition that these individuals have. But the apostles here, Paul speaks of the 12, the 12 disciples that Jesus chose, plus one, the apostle Paul, who would be the apostle to the Gentiles. And there really is no need for prophets today, at least in the sense of foretelling the future, because we have the written word of God. We know what the future holds for us. Now, a prophet today, if he is prophetic in his message, he preaches the word of God. He says, thus saith the Lord. And typically, a prophet will always call God's people to repentance. I remember when I was in a church, when I was uh, getting my feet wet preaching, I was in a little church over in Tampa. It was a liberal church, but I took it because I needed to get some practice preaching. <laughs> There was a, I walked in and one of the elders of this church was teaching a Sunday school class and, and he's looking at the Old Testament prophets. He was in the book of Isaiah, but he kind of made this side note. He says, now we have prophets today like, you know, you've heard of Nostradamus and you've Gene Dixon who was a clairvoyant and some of these other people who are, are, are psychics. This man's name was Bob, and, and I just cringed when I heard him say that because, you know, somebody, even somebody who was phenomenal, I guess, as Nostradamus, he was 100%. And according to Deuteronomy chapter 18, if they just make one mistake, then they're disqualified from being a prophet of God. I pointed that out to Bob, and I said, plus these people, they don't care about how you live. A prophet of God is going to talk about sin and righteousness, and he's going to call people to repent. And Bob kind of looks, looks at me. And this was, like, this was like my third week there. And he sits back and he says, well, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> this was a fun church, too. I was there for about a year. I, one Sunday morning, I actually had to break up a fight b between the organist and one of the elders. One Saturday, two elders came in and they redid the church library and they just took everything off. They, they meant well, they cleaned, but then they just threw the books up on the shelf. <laughs> and, and Betty, who was the organist, she was probably the only church lady in the church that I thought was truly saved. I'm not sure about the rest of them. But she was furious because she had cataloged all the books in there. And I mean, it was a pretty good sized library for a small church, but but... This uh, elder, he was an old cattle rancher. And I mean, he just egged her on. 
And I had to take Betty aside and tell you, Betty, you're getting ready to lead in worship. You, you just forgive him. And, you know, just, I mean, but that was the kind of experience. I think the Lord taught me a lot about how to deal with impossible people in that church. Um, but, but anyway, um, back to elders and <laughs> prophets. Um, there really is no need for prophets today, at least as far as telling the future. Then he mentions evangelists. And evangelists, they had the spiritual gift of evangelism. That's where they announced the good news of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And people respond typically to those who have the gift. I would say Peter had the gift. His first two sermons got 8,000 people saved. Billy Graham, we know, would be a contemporary example of an evangelist. Greg Laurie today, also, he's a pastor in California, but he also does a lot of crusades and is uh, very successful in leading people to faith in Christ. But the work of an evangelist basically just tells, is engaged in telling people, unsaved people, about how to be saved. Remember we said last week, it's, it was likened to one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. We know the bread of life. And an evangelist loves to share that. Of course, you don't have to have the gift of evangelism to be an evangelist. We are supposed to be witnesses for Christ. We are supposed to be making disciples. That's part of the responsibility of all of us. It's just that those who have the spiritual gift are generally more successful. And you see more fruit for their ministry. But that doesn't absolve any of us from having to share the gospel with people and tell people about how to be saved. But certain people were uniquely gifted for soul women, women, winning and given to the church as evangelists. Every church needs to have evangelists in here. Then Jesus gives us pastors and teachers. Now last week I separated these, but in the Greek, these two would go together um, as pastor-teacher. The text puts them together and it's best understood as one office of leadership within the church. The word pastor, we know, means shepherd. We are Christ's under-shepherd, the pastor. And of course, Walter as an elder is also a shepherd. Jadel as an elder is also a shepherd. We are pastors in the truest sense of the word. Shepherds or pastors, teachers are Men who have what has been termed as a pastor's heart. That is, they genuinely care for the spiritual welfare of God's people. Their primary goals are to guide and to feed. You remember the Lord Jesus when he restored Peter back into fellowship after denying him three times? Three times he said, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. We have to he asked him, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Every time Jesus responded with, feed my sheep, teach them the word of God. That is our spiritual sustenance. Teachers, I mentioned this last week too, they should, uh, uh, they should have the, the, the one who's a pastor should have the spiritual gift of teaching. That's a separate gift. But pastors, teachers are also gifted and they have these gifts to minister to the church. It's a spirit-given ability to explain the scriptures effectively and clearly to help others understand. The primary purpose of a teacher is just to give the meaning of scripture and then to help God's people to understand what it's saying, to give you the sense of what this is what God says, and then to help you try to apply it to your life. And then, of course, we provide guidance and so spiritual gifts that are helpful to a pastor teacher would be things like the gift of exhortation, the gift of wisdom, some other spiritual gifts that would go hand in hand with fulfilling the role of a pastor teacher. And then there are teachers, that I mentioned them separately, but this is a, the illustration that I showed you last week of the foundation, Jesus Christ, and then on that, the foundation is built by the prophets and the apostles, and then you have the evangelists, the pastors, teachers, and of course, teachers. And then, of course, 
you don't have to be a pastor teacher to be a teacher. You can have the gift of teaching. Um, and that gift can be displayed in a variety of ways. For example, uh, Mary and Susan are pretty effective at teaching three and four year olds. For me, it would be like trying to herd cats. I just don't fit into that element. I mean, I love children and I, and I do try to teach them, but I don't know if I could do it for a whole hour. <laughs> but but so, so the gift of teaching comes in a variety of, of nuances where she can teach to younger children and others can teach and reach teenagers and then others can reach adults. And so you see the the different aspects to that one gift of teaching. So apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, those gifted to bring the lost in and gifted to feed and lead God's people. So now we move on to verse 12, and the first thing, we see three things here. But Christ gave gifted servants to build his church for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. These, again, these are servant leaders that God gives to the church for the benefit of the body to help us learn the word of God, to help us learn what our spiritual gifts are, and then to help us develop them and put them into practice. And there are three purposes that he mentions. The first thing he mentions here is that the servant leaders are to equip the saints for ministry. Now, the word saints means those who are set apart. If you're saved, if you're born again, you are a saint. Got St. Mark sitting right up here in the first row. And St. Jennifer. We are all saints by virtue of our faith in Jesus Christ. We have been set apart from the world, from sin, unto God. And when an evangelist or a pastor teacher and a teacher, they use their position and they exercise their spiritual gifts, the saints, that's us, benefit. And we are equipped with everything that we need to live the Christian life, but also to discover the spiritual gifts and the insights that will help us to serve the Lord and His church. S. Lewis Johnson said that's their one duty, to equip the saints. Now, I would say that's a little bit broader than that, but that is their primary function. And it's interesting that over the last several decades, we have had these church growth movements. It's become an industry today. With books and conferences and workshops, programs, organizations devoted to church growth. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with any of that. We all need to learn pointers on how to effectively minister so that the church can grow. However, you have to stay within the bounds and the parameters of the scriptures. But in many cases, they have resorted to business and entertainment practices to attract people to, uh, for church growth. And often church growth leaders sound more like sales representatives or self-help gurus. Consequently, you'll often find churches that minimize the importance of preaching God's Word. In some cases, they have deleted it altogether. In other cases, they've just kind of confined it to a little short 10-minute, what you call a, would call a sermonette. Sermonettes for the little Christianettes. But they, are, but they also are, 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 are just more like self-help, positive speaking into your life. And I would just imagine that probably 75% of you, when I talk about somebody who s preaches like that, somebody comes to your mind. I won't mention them, but I, I'm sure you have an idea who I might be talking about. And they end up resorting to feel-good pep talks. They end up losing or watering down the gospel message. They resort to gimmicks, to drawing people in. I know one preacher in, in Texas, 
actually, when he was talking about spiritual warfare, I don't know how he did this. I mean, it was a huge one of the mega churches. He actually had a physical tank on the stage. <laughs> you know, good for him, I'm, but <laughs> I think that's uh, carrying it a little bit too far, but... But they do all kinds of things to draw people in, and then worship becomes nothing more than entertainment. Because you got lights and smoke. I went to my brother's church. He doesn't go there anymore, but years ago he went to a church in Atlanta. And uh, one of the worship leaders was a former member of Kansas, but I remember the lights and the smoke, and it was, uh, you know, it, it was reminiscent of my days at rock concerts. And I'm not against upbeat music. I mean, my son will tell you. That, but it's not about entertainment. The true church cannot grow without effective evangelism and Bible teaching and shepherding because these leaders provide the means for equipping the saints so that they can, in turn, do the work of the ministry. The word for equipping can mean to make complete or to make fit. Remember, we said from Colossians chapter 2, that we are in Christ, and if we are in Christ, we are already complete. That's a positional truth, that we are in Christ. We stand perfect. We are justified before a holy God. Every believer has that perfect standing before God. And Paul says in Colossians 2, 9 and 10, For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are made complete in Him. And he is the head of all principality and power. So in other words, positionally, you have everything you need by virtue of the presence of Christ in your life. You're fully equipped. If you are in Christ. But practically now, what we are equipped with needs to be developed. There are four tools that God will give us to equip us to make us ready. He says, Now the God of peace, who brought, up, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Now obviously the first thing that he'll bring to us that he's provided is the word of God. That should go without saying. Paul told Timothy that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. In other words, literally, that means God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for, correct, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. On the cover of your bulletin, you'll find Colossians chapter 1 and verse 28 says, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect or complete in Christ Jesus. That's one of the themes of our ministry here. I mean, primarily we say it's all about Jesus, but that verse is a thematic verse for the ministry here. The second tool is prayer. Peter mentioned that the elders and the pastor's primary responsibility in Acts chapter 6, you remember the, the church was brand new, 8,000 new believers, and all you got is a handful of leaders there, and they're starting to have problems, and so they raise up deacons. But Peter says, we must give ourselves to the Word of God and to prayer. And Paul says to the Colossian church, he says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So prayer is another tool that God will use. The third thing that he'll use is trials. We have been called to suffer. We don't like to suffer, but every one of us, if you're breathing, will go through some trials and tribulations. The only people that aren't, won't ever suffer are the people that are in the cemetery. But James says in his 
epistle, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience or endurance. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So trials come to us because they stretch our faith. They test our faith. They perfect our faith. And they prepare us for whatever it is that God may want to use us for. Peter says in his first epistle, chapter 5, But may the God of all grace, who, is called, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect or complete, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So these are three things that God will use for us. The word of God, prayer, prayer. And trials. The fourth thing that we'll use is what we've already talked about a little bit, and that's spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. This manifestation of the Spirit is in the form of spiritual gifts. And so we find, secondly, that the saints are to exercise their gifts for the work of ministry. Everyone in the body of Christ is to do some kind of ministry. We are saved to serve. It's not just the pastor's job. All of us are called to be servants. And to do that, he has given us spiritual gifts. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Peter says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So the question for us is, do you know what your spiritual gifts are? Do you even know what they are? First of all, let me explain to you exactly what they are. Here's a, a working definition that comes from MacArthur's commentary. But spiritual gifts are divine enablements. They're supernatural abilities that come with the Spirit for ministry. Characteristics of Jesus Christ that are manifested through the body corporate just as they were manifested through the body incarnate. In other words, what he's saying is each gift of the Spirit had its perfect expression in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. So in a very real sense, the church continues to live out the life of Christ here on earth. So when you are exercising your spiritual gifts, it is as if it actually is in fact. Jesus Christ manifesting his gifts through you. We are the manifestation of Christ in the world today. We are his mouth. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are his heart. And we serve one another and we reach out to the world with the love of Christ and the word of God. A spiritual gift is a skill or ability given by the Holy Spirit at the moment that a person trusts the Lord Jesus as their Savior. And it enables the Christian to perform a special function, a particular function within the body of Christ for the edification and the glory of God. Wayne Barber describes the spiritual gifts as a supernatural ability sovereignly given by the Holy Spirit, given to strengthen his saints who as they serve one another being good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now I need to point out that there are other abilities and talents and gifts that we all have. For example, uh, you may have the gift of, of music, or you may have the gift of, you may be artistic, or you may have some other special ability, perhaps maybe like my son Tim is a mechanic and he can work well with, with engines. These aren't necessarily gifts, they're not spiritual gifts, at least in the strict sense of the word, but they are spiritual in the sense that they are talents and gifts given to each of us that they ought to be used for the glory of God and for the benefit of His church. 
Now, I don't have time really to go through and explain all the spiritual gifts because it would really slow our progress through the book of Ephesians. So I'm going to pull a Stuart Briscoe on you. I'm just going to tell you where you can find the spiritual gifts. Here are five lists that you find that outline some of the spiritual gifts. And I just want to encourage you to seek them out. You can simplify it by just reading uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans chapter 12 because each one of these. And you might also add uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 8 through 10 specifically. But look these up. And then ask the Lord, as you read through these gifts, Lord, is there something here? If you've not been able to discern what spiritual gift you may have, just read it with a searching heart, asking God, God, show me, is there something you want me to do? And then the only way to manifest that gift is to start doing it. I had no idea about the gift of teaching until I started teaching. But this is a chart where you can find them. And, and so I would like to uh, just encourage you to read these. And then if there's ample you know, interest, if you want to know more about spiritual gifts, if you want to get into it some more, let me know because I'll be more than happy to, to, to study it with you. But I want to encourage you to look into it yourself. So, what I would like to do now is just give you some reasons why you should investigate spiritual gifts. Reasons to investigate and discover whether you have a spiritual gift. Not whether, you do, if you're saved. <laughs> N- number one is because we are commanded to exercise them. It's a command, this is not a suggestion. It's not just an idea for us to to think about and ponder on and consider. Secondly, because if you don't know what your gift is, we'll never discover God's perfect will for our lives. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. And don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, You get your mind renewed when you get into the Word that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's how you do the will of God. You surrender yourself. One of the fundamental questions that a lot of people ask a lot of pastors is, how can I know the will of God for my life? And well, that's one place where it starts. Just presenting your body a living sacrifice. Lord, here I am. What do you want me to do? That's all Isaiah did. Lord, here am I. Send me. You will never fully understand your purpose in life until you discover why you're here. You were saved. You were sanctified. You were gifted so that you might exercise those gifts for the will and the purposes of God. We are here for the glory of God. And if I find something to do apart from any of those spiritual gifts being exercised, then I'm just not really fulfilling my purpose in life. There is nothing more satisfying in life than knowing that you're doing what you were called and saved to do. Thirdly, he says to Timothy, he exhorted Timothy to stir up the gift that's in him. Timothy was Paul's son in the faith. And he discipled him and he helped him as he responded to God's call in his life. He was a pastor, but he wanted him to maximize his spiritual gifts. And again, we talked about evangelism. Part of the process of evangelism, it starts with evangelism, but it doesn't stop there because we're called to make disciples too. That's what we follow up with. I lead somebody to Jesus, but then let me help them grow. Fourthly, because if you know what they are, you can take steps to discover them and develop them. Again, you receive them at the moment of salvation, but as I mentioned earlier, when I first started preaching, I mean, I was dry as burnt toast. It was, 
you know, I stammered and stuttered and hemmed and hawed and I was nervous. But those gifts come in kind of like an embryonic form. And they begin to grow as you exercise and as you practice. As you, you, so you don't start off perfect with these gifts. You learn them and you develop them and you exercise them. And as you do, you become more efficient, more effective. And as you discover your gift, you can develop it and fit it into your life and ministry. But you need to study them so you can know what they are. Then fifth, because you can begin to pray and seek God's ministry for opportunities according to your gifts. Ask God for wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives liberally and upbraids not. You don't know what your gifts are? God, show me. Put in my heart some desire. Show me in your word what the gifts are and then pop one of them out at me. Six, because you will experience joy and fulfillment as you obey God's will. We sing that old hymn, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's a true, that's a true saying. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Prior to that, he talks about our salvation. But he says that we were saved so that we can do good works. That he's already determined what they are and he's gifted you so that you can do them. Then number seven, because if you don't and you remain ignorant and disobedient, then you hinder the effectiveness in church and growth of Christ's church, of his body. The Lord saved us and he sovereignly put us here because he has something for all of us to do. And if we aren't doing it, it's like, you know, it's, it's like trying to lay bricks with one hand or it's like trying to run a race with a pulled hamstring. Like trying to sing with laryngitis. Some of us already sound like we're singing with laryngitis. Jesus saved us because he needs us for a healthy function of his body. And in this case, this local body of believers, Lakeland Bible Church. But that applies also to the church universal. But now, remember, he is writing this to a local church in the city of Ephesus. So those are some Good reasons why we should investigate, why we should learn what they are, why we should study them. Because we don't know what they are, and if we don't exercise them, we are hindering the body of Christ from functioning healthily in the world. Spiritual service is the work of every Christian, of every saint. And attendance is great. But honestly, it's a poor substitute for participation in the body life of, Christ, of, of the church. All of us need to be effectively doing something by way of service for Christ. And when that happens, thirdly, the work of ministry edifies the body of Christ. That word for edify literally means it's literally used of building a house. And it's through each one of us exercising our spiritual gifts that Christ builds his church. We aren't doing it. You remember Jesus Christ said, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades and hell will not prevail against it. Jesus said he will build his church. We're not building his church. He is building his church, but he's doing it through each one of us as we exercise our spiritual gifts. So as you can see, the work of the ministry belongs to the entire body of believers. We should all be equipped and guided and encouraged by those who are gifted to evangelize and teach, to expound the word of God, to apply the word with wisdom and power. The entire body, all of us, none excluded, and it doesn't matter 
there are no age restrictions either. If you're six years old and you're saved, you got a spiritual gift when you got saved. If you're 90 years old, you still have a spiritual gift. But every saint has a spiritual gift, and our task is to discover those gifts. And my task as a pastor is to help you, to not only discover, but also to help you develop. And when we rediscover the pattern and the strategy of Ephesians chapter 4, when all Christians in the body exercise their God-given role as ministers of God's eternal plan, then the entire body will become alive with resurrection power and life. Lives will be changed and ministries will be effective and communities will be touched. And the church will become healthy and vital and exciting. And let me just tell you this. A lot of people don't want to go to church today because church is boring. But let me suggest that perhaps maybe the reason church could be boring for you is that you have not really discovered what it means to have a spiritual gift and to exercise that for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ and the edification of the body. I can promise you, when you get into that, then church life can become exciting. Because it is God who works in you to both to will and to do of His good pleasure. He's the one that wants to do the work. So the purpose of service is to build up. It's the purpose of every act of service. Jesus said that the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom. Whatever it is, preaching, teaching, The guys back there working in the sound booth, setting up chairs and tables for fellowship meal, coming for a work day, teaching, giving, praying. All of those are ministries that we can exercise. And the body of Christ needs us because if you're not effectively serving and exercising your gift, you are in essence handicapping the body. We exist in the body to build one another up. And then, of course, when this takes place, then we move on to verses 13 through 16, and we'll find what will be the result next time, which I'm not sure. I'm still waiting on Brother Jodell to do part two of his last message. But he had some things take place this week that prevented him from doing that. But, but anyway, we'll finish up this section as the Lord leads. Amen? So let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Our Father, we want to thank you that you can take frail, faulty, sinful people and you can forgive us and you can cleanse us and you can sanctify and perfect us and make us fit to be used for the edifying of your church. I pray, Father, that your spirit and your word would reveal to each one of us the gifts that you have given us. And may we surrender our wills to yours so that Jesus Christ may live and work and work in us and through us and for us. May we do your will so that this local body of believers can be vibrant and effective and healthy, eager to make Christ known so that we can walk worthy of our calling. And we pray and ask these things together, praying in Jesus' blessed name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you, friends. We are dismissed.